welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the museum. Very pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on the future of healthcare with Paul Starr and moderated by Ian Masters. Ian is a BBC trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m. and the Daily Briefing Mondays through Thursdays at 5 p.m. on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia, and all of you for coming tonight to learn about the future of healthcare that may dramatically change any day now as we wait for the Supreme Court to release its ruling on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Before public arguments were made in the Supreme Court for and against so-called Obamacare, the majority of legal scholars and pundits assured us it was highly unlikely the court would strike down any or even some of the Affordable Care Act. But since the hearings, the ground has shifted with the Chatterati moving on as if the solid foundation of the commerce, commerce Clause and precedent were yesterday's news to the latest punditry that offers the comfortable assumption that not just some, but all of Obama's signature healthcare overhaul could be thrown out. After Bush v. Gore, there was some reason to question the cherished notion that the nine independent impartial arbiters in the Temple of Justice were guardians of the Constitution and not political hacks. But now, according to a recent CBS New York Times poll, 76% of Americans think the justices are more informed by political part partisanship than judicial reasoning. So, whatever we have lost, so whether we have lost our innocence or we are confronting a new cynicism, the conservative majority who brought us Citizen United might well be poised to raise the stakes on judicial activism and put our first black president in his place. And judging by the recent display of conservative contempt that interrupted a presidential address in the Rose Garden, disrespect is apparently perfectly acceptable in our new political culture of win at all cost and whatever it costs to win. The media, enslaved as it is by false equivalence and incapable of judgment or truth, refers to the five conservatives and four liberals on the court as a balance that could be tipped by the moderate Justice Kennedy. In fact, there are, no, there are some arch and ultra conservatives on the court, a number of corporatists, some centrists, and a lot of Catholics, but there are no liberals. At least like they used to be, with liberals like Thurgood Marshall and William O. Douglas, who President Ford replaced with a conservative justice, John Paul Stevens. Ironically, Justice Stevens ended up one of the most liberal on the court, and since his recent retirement, he has broken precedent to castigate his former fellow justices over Citizens United, which perhaps shows you how much the court and the country has moved to the right. Believe it or not, we are not going to talk about the judiciary tonight, but instead we will discuss the future of healthcare. But while on the subject of late and lamented liberal lines, Senator Edward Kennedy, who did not live to see the Affordable Care Act pass, said one of his greatest regrets was that he did not take Nixon up on his offer for, of universal health care, but instead waited for a better deal. Liberals and progressives are often accused of falling into the trap of the perfect being the enemy of the good. Meanwhile, over the decades, the relentless assault on the institution of government itself has led to a corporate takeover of our politics and a pervasive belief that only the free market can deliver. Indeed, we are at a time when the Republicans, after a bruising primary and doubts about their less than inspiring candidate, are now fired up and are coming together in the belief that they can win in 2012. Conversely, we are seeing the Democrats coming to the opposite realization that their candidate, who soon to be safe, could lose. If we are to have a corporatist in the White House as the CEO of America Incorporated, that will surely prove to be the nail in the coffin for Teddy Kennedy. 
because what is left of the public option in healthcare will be rolled back and starved to death if the Ryan budget is to be adopted as promised. Now, as we watch Southern, units, as we watch Southern Europe's social safety net shredded by demands of austerity, our conservative pundits are crowing that the Europeans will have to be more like the Americans and cut loose their underperforming citizens in the name of budget discipline. It is ironic that it was the United States under the Marshall Plan that created the social democracies for Europe and Japan where their fortunate citizens have since had universal health care and benefits and paid vacations we can only dream of. Back in 1948 when the Cold War was getting underway, we were afraid the communists would take over Europe, so we showed them a better way of life. But President Truman was not able to do the same for his own people. Sixty years later, what will it take to get affordable health care for Americans? Perhaps we need the communists to come back and threaten America so that then we will take better care of our own citizens. Our guest tonight, Paul Starr, will speak for about 15 minutes. Then we'll have a discussion followed by extensive Q&A with our lively and informed audience. Paul Starr is a Pulitzer Prize winning professor of sociology and public affairs at Princeton. He is also the co-editor with Robert Kuttner and co-founder with Robert Kuttner and Robert Reich of American, The American Prospect. His book, The Social Transformation of American Medicine, won the 1985 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction, as well as the Bancroft Prize. In 1993, he was the senior advisor for President Bill Clinton's proposed health care reform plan. And his latest book is Remedy and Reaction, The Peculiar Struggle Over Health Care Reform. And after the forum, Paul Starr will be signing copies of Remedy and Reaction upstairs in the lobby as you leave. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Starr. Well, thank you very much, Ian, and thanks to all of you for coming uh, this evening. I can't imagine a more uncertain or tense moment to be talking about the future of healthcare. Uh, as we all know, the Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act is imminent. It will be posted at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard T Time one day in the next week. It could be posted tomorrow morning, more likely next Monday. A Washington Post reporter that I was speaking to uh, a few days ago said the only thing she knew for sure is that the Supreme Court website would crash the morning that decision goes up. Well, a lot more may come down with, uh, with that decision uh, besides the website. Now, I find myself in an unusual position on the issue that is at the heart of the case before the court. That is the question of the individual mandate. I strongly believe the law is constitutional and that the court uh, should um, uphold it. But during the debate over the legislation, um, I was um, against the provision for the mandate. And I argued for an alternative. I was worried that the mandate could provoke a backlash. That was the theme of an article that I wrote for the American Prospect. I was worried that it could endanger the popularity of the whole reform effort and could become the focus of uh, the opposition. Um, and um, so I parted ways with many of my friends on that question. And uh, alas, uh, a lot of what I worried about has come to pass, and much worse than I, uh, I really, uh, I really uh, imagined. Uh, I uh, wrote about this in the, in the Prospect, I, an op-ed in the New York Times. I talked uh, uh, on the phone with Henry Waxman. I, I uh, went down to Washington, talked with congressional staff on both the House and Senate side, tried to see if there was any room uh, for uh, rethinking this issue. But, uh, you know, the, the, the train had left the station at that point and there was, there was no um, potential for reconsidering it. Uh, I, I worried about this in particular because um, the mandate could create an adversarial relationship between uh, the government and the very people who were um, uh, supposed to be helped under the law. 
I was very struck this morning reading in an article in the Times a uh, quotation from a woman who is uninsured and who would be who would receive subsidized insurance under the law and who said, well, she's against the law because of the mandate. And she was positive that she couldn't afford uh, insurance. Well, I had conversations just like that one uh, uh, that led me to, to write uh, uh, what I did about the mandate. Uh, conversations actually on call-in radio shows where people called in and said, uh, well, you might as well just take me to jail. I, can, I know I can't afford insurance. And, and I'd say, well, but there'll be subsidies. Uh, uh, to enable you to afford it. Well, there's a lot of distrust out there of the government and telling people that they are going to get subsidies and that it's all going to be okay uh, just doesn't uh, work. And so uh, what we've had is, is what for many people is a very unexpected explosion and uh, uh, problem, but one that I think really could have been foreseen and um, which uh, is now uh, has brought us to the brink of uh, a potential reversal and disaster on this, on this question. Now, before I get into how else we might deal with the problems that the mandate is uh, an answer to, I want to step back and give a little bit of history and explain how this law is supposed to work. Now, as many of you may remember, the individual mandate was actually a Republican idea to begin with. Back in the early 1990s, you may remember that Pre President Clinton uh, proposed uh, uh, a major reform of health care. Well, I worked in the White House at that time. I was very much involved in it. And the main financing mechanism for the Clinton health plan was what's called an employer mandate, a requirement that employers pay a proportion of the premium for health insurance, an idea, by the way, that has always gotten overwhelming support from the American public. Republicans said, well, that's too much government, that employer mandate. What we need is an individual mandate, they said. And this was an idea that had been worked up as a proposal at the leading conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, and was embodied in uh, a bill that was introduced uh, by a leading, 20, there were 20 Senate Republican co-sponsors, including uh, the Republican leader, Bob Dole. Uh, and, um, and they said uh, an individual mandate is the right way. It's the way of individual responsibility. And um, that was the true conservative position, to have an individual mandate. And so when Governor Mitt Romney in Massachusetts was looking for a way to uh, pursue an ambitious goal, he, he thought he would take up this uh, cause of universal health insurance, he turned to the Heritage Foundation and other conservative advisors, and they said, an individual mandate is the way to go. And what Massachusetts did was, first of all, to expand Medicaid and the CHIP program for low-income families, and then to create a health insurance exchange with subsidies for people whose incomes were just above the poverty level and so they could afford insurance on a sliding scale basis. And that was a, an approach that brought together Democrats and Republicans in Massachusetts. And uh, as you know, it got carried out. Massachusetts became the first state to achieve near universal coverage uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this country. And many Democrats said, well, you know, the individual mandate wasn't the way we wanted to do this, uh, but OK. Uh, if that can get bipartisan support, let's make it the basis of national proposals. And by the way, although Mitt Romney denies it, he was also saying, look at what Massachusetts uh, has done, and that can be the model for federal legislation. Uh, so um, that became the basis for the Affordable Care Act. The same architecture, that is expand Medicaid for the poor, and then create a, um, a, a series of insurance exchanges around the country where people can easily and efficiently buy uh, health insurance under a new set of rules. So what, what are these new rules that are uh, 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 carried out under, should be carried out under the Affordable Care Act? Well, most important, insurers would not be able to deny coverage of pre-existing condition and they would not be able to set prices to consumers according to their health. 
That's a rule called community rating. Same rate regardless of your health. And there'd be a system of subsidies. Uh, again, uh, a kind of sliding scale to enable um, low-income people above the Medicaid level but uh, 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 to, to uh, afford coverage. Um, so um, that's, the, that's the basic architecture of the Affordable Care Act. How does the mandate figure into this? Well, if you're going to uh, say that everybody can buy coverage that will not exclude pre-existing conditions and that will not reflect their health, you open up the possibility that some people will game the system, that they will decide not to buy health insurance until they get sick. And no health insurance system can work if people can buy insurance in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. That's not, it, you have to have the healthy paying in as well as the sick, or the system just doesn't function. That's, that's the rationale for the mandate. That's the reasoning behind it. Makes sense. Except it's not the only way to do it. Well, before I get to the alternatives, let me just explain a little bit more about what the mandate is. I think very few words have been more deceptive than the term mandate. When I think of a mandate, I think of something like the draft, as it used to be, where if you didn't register for the draft, you know, that, that's a, you could get sent to jail. That was, that was, that, that, that's a real mandate. Now, what happens under the mandate in the Affordable Care Act? Well, there, if you don't, now, let's be clear, you're not affected by it if you're already covered by Medicare or Medicaid. You're not affected by it if you have coverage from your employer. You're not affected by it if you're a veteran and you can get care at a, at a veteran's hospital. You're not affected by it if you have religious objections to medical care. You're exempt. You're not affected by it if your income is lower than the, than the tax filing threshold, the income tax filing threshold. And you're not affected by it if the lowest cost plan after subsidies would cost more than 8% of your income. You're exempt on hardship grounds. Actually, only about 7% of the population would be affected by the band-aid. Okay, so that's all, that's what we're talking about. Now, that 7% would, would be subject to fines, but what happens if you don't pay the fine? Nothing, nothing. Okay, so you can't be sent to jail, your wages can't be garnished, the government can't seize your property. The most the government can do to enforce the mandate is to withhold a tax refund. That's the only enforcement power. That's the terrible mandate that's a threat to individual liberty in this country. Okay? It's, it has been inflated into something way beyond what is actually in the law. And, and uh, my problem with the mandate is that it seems too strong to people. It seems like an overreach of government. People don't really understand the rationale for it. They don't understand what it is. And yet, actually, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not very strong. It's actually a very weak provision. And it might not work all that well in getting people to sign up. It did work in Massachusetts. But Massachusetts is a very special case. Massachusetts is a special case because it started out with more than 90% of the population already insured, unlike Texas and Louisiana and so forth, where you've got more than a quarter of the population without health insurance. Uh, and in, Ma in Massachusetts, you had the complete backing of business and labor, Democrats, Republicans, the healthcare industry. They had ads with the Boston Red Sox on TV saying, now's the time to get health insurance. They had total support. That's not the situation in much of the country today. And so the idea that the mandate is going to change social norms, is going to lead people to um, uh, feel they have to be insured, that just won't necessarily happen. So the mandate worked in Massachusetts, but I don't think it will necessarily work all that well elsewhere. So OK, what could we have done if we didn't have a mandate? Well, we could have done a number of other things. Um, so we know from a lot of research in other areas that there's a tremendous difference in how people respond when they are offered an opt-in versus an opt-out. Just an example, 
on 401k plans. If employees are offered um, uh, an opt-in, they have to sign up for them. Many fewer will sign up for those than if they're offered an opt-out. That is, if they automatically are enrolled in the 401k uh, uh, and have to opt out of it. Uh, if we had set this up on this basis so that you're in, you're insured, unless you opt out. You have to take an active effort to opt out. So there'd be choice, but the choice would be set up in a way to nudge people in. Um, now, I considered what some other countries have done to get people in. And Germany um, provides people a choice about whether to enroll in the public sickness funds that have existed since the late 19th century. In Germany, you can opt out. But if you opt out, it's a lifetime choice, and you can't get back in. Well, I thought that was a, that's a bit harsh. Uh, but um, we, could make, we could have a long-term opt-out. So here's the thing. What we need to prevent is people opportunistically going back and forth, deciding to sign up for insurance only when they're sick and they're not paying for it when they're healthy. And so so it, we can let people opt out as long as they can't opt back in whenever they want. I propose, well, let's make it a five-year opt-out. So you can opt out, be a choice. You'd have to sign this form. I don't believe many people would do this. Now, what would happen if you did, if you did sign the opt-out? It would mean that you wouldn't get the subsidies, you wouldn't be able to use the insurance exchanges, you wouldn't necessarily be able to get a policy with no pre-existing condition exclusions. In other words, you could try to buy insurance, but it would be like the market is today. So you wouldn't lose anything. I don't want to punish people for this, but it would be a way to incentivize people to come in. So uh, I was looking for some way to reassure people who don't trust the government, who are afraid of a mandate, who believe that it will pose on them costs they can't afford. Something to be able to, look, if, if, if you can opt out, you, you don't have to be part of this. I think if we could have had that in the legislation, we would never have had this uh, constitutional case. There would, have not, there would simply not be the issue that is now before the Supreme Court. And we could have answered a lot of the objections that many people have. Now, my proposal is only one of a whole group of alternatives. Under Medicare Part D, there is no mandate. You do not have to sign up for the prescription drug coverage. But if you don't sign up at the initial open enrollment period, the premiums go up. That's another way to create incentives to get people to come in. And um, there are technical arguments among economists as to which are more effective. Um, uh, we could have actually done this in a way where we could have let states choose among a menu of alternative policies. And the states would have then been responsible for carrying them out. And maybe we would have learned something from the experimentation that could have gone on uh, among the different states. So there were other ways to do it. But now, many people say, well, it's too late. And maybe it is too late. Much depends on exactly what the Supreme Court decides. So let's come back to the Supreme Court case. Uh, there are two big issues before the court. One is the constitutionality of the individual mandate. And the other is the constitutionality of the expansion of Medicaid. And let me just say one word about the Medicaid issue. That may have far-ranging implications. So under this legislation, uh, Congress has uh, uh, provided uh, nearly all of the additional cost for the expansion of Medicaid. It's 100% of the cost for the states over the next several years. And then it goes down to 90% of the cost in like 2017 or 2018. Uh, it's um, uh, nonetheless, some states say that the federal government is unjustly imposing costs on states. The, the, the federal government is commandeering the states. That's the language that they are using. And this, if the court were to take that view, it would undermine a tremendous number of joint federal-state programs 
where we have federal legislation that sets minimum standards in the states. That's what is fundamentally at issue here. I hope, <laughs> I hope the court doesn't uh, unravel the Medicaid provisions. That would, as I say, just go way beyond health care. Now, on the individual mandate, the court first has to decide whether it can decide the issue. There is an obscure 1867 law, the Anti-Injunction Act, that says that no one has standing to sue to restrain the imposition of a future tax until they have suffered an actual harm from it. And if the court determines that the penalties for going uninsured constitute a tax within the meaning of this 1867 law, then the whole case is put off until 2015. Now, actually, some, one of the appellate courts took this view. A number of judges uh, along the way took this view. Uh, from the oral argument, very few people at the Supreme Court, very few people believe the Supreme Court will take that view. But it is a possibility that the court may not decide the question. Then there is the mandate itself. And the mandate itself is actually two separate provisions of the law. And the court could rule differently on those provisions. One provision is the provision that says, that everybody must have insurance. And the other provision is the one that sets out the penalties for going without insurance with all of those limitations that I mentioned. It is conceivable that the court would strike down the mandate but uphold the penalties under the taxing power of Congress. Uh, uh, that would mean that the court would effectively make a symbolic statement by stri striking down the mandate, but the rest of the law would stand. Now, the final question, and what may ultimately be the biggest one if the court does strike down the mandate, is the issue of severability. That's the question of whether other provisions of the law must fall if the mandate falls. And here, there is a tremendous range of possibilities with different political implications. The court could just strike down the mandate, the mandate and the penalties, and leave everything else. That is what the Atlanta court did, the case which the, is being reviewed by the Supreme Court. In that case, I do believe that the problems can be remedied. There are all these alternatives. Some of them can be carried out administratively. I believe the law could survive if the court just struck down the mandate and the mandate alone. That is not the view of everybody in this field, but I believe it is a survivable wound. On the other hand, the court may go on. It may strike down the insurance market reforms regarding pre-existing conditions and equal rates for people regardless of health. The court may strike those down too. It may strike down all of what's called Title, title I in the law. That would be the subsidies, the exchanges. It may, of course, then go to, and strike down the entire law. It is, it is possible, although that would seem to be an extraordinary uh, reach of judicial activism. So we face this whole range of possibilities. I said at the beginning it's a moment of tremendous uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty because um, policy could now go in such drastic directions. If the Affordable Care Act survives and is carried out, it won't achieve all the good things that we would like to see in healthcare by a long shot. But it would reduce the number of uninsured by about 30 million. It would achieve near universal coverage. It would be a historic advance, in my view, for this country. On the other hand, if the Affordable Care Act goes and the Ryan budget gets carried out by a Republican president in Congress, that will reduce coverage under Medicaid because of the way that financing for Medicaid would change. Uh, and over a decade, probably another 20 million people would lose coverage. So we might see the number of uninsured fall dramatically on the one hand, or we might see the number of uninsured go up very dramatically. There's a swing there of about 50 million people. Uh, a difference that would have huge implications for social inequality in America. So we are, we are standing at, uh, at this moment of decision. And uh, I wish I could say 
uh, that I was confident that we were going to end up in the right place. I'm not at all. I'm very, very anxious. Uh, there's, an, there's an article in the Washington Post today that discusses views about the consequences of the Supreme Court repealing, um, uh, uh, overturning the mandate. And I get quoted there, and, and the Washington Post article says that I am relaxed about the possibility <laughs> of uh, uh, the mandate getting overturned. Uh, th that's not, uh, I do believe, as I said, it's a survivable wound if it's only the mandate that is struck down. But I am not relaxed at all. I am very tense. I am very worried. And I think all of Americans should be. Well, to further unrelax you, <laughs> the Supreme Court today ruled, at least the ruling came out today, uh, on a California case involving the SEIU and public employees unions, uh, which essentially uh, went way beyond the confines of the case itself. Alito wrote the majority opinion, and, it's just, and it will effectively uh, defund public employees unions and, uh, in, radically because everybody will have an opt-out clause. Uh, and we know that there's been the assault against public employees unions. Uh, it seems to be a part of the, the Republican political platform. So. Uh, Rather than suggest that, that the Supreme Court is an extension of the Republican Party, I, I'm suggesting that they've already indicated today that they're quite prepared to, to be radical uh, um, if, if indeed people didn't notice uh, Citizens United. Um, what, what explains the, you just, the, the thing that, the bombshell that you dropped for me was that only, the mandate's only about 7%. Mm -hmm. This whole argument is over 7%. So why is it that the Concerned Women of America, this right-wing group, are now launching this massive ad buy to trash Obamacare? Uh, the, all we've ever heard about is, is this terrible thing called the mandate. Where's the countervailing voice? I mean, it's not there. Why can't somebody on the Democratic side or the White House side point that out? It's only 7%. I, I don't expect... The, you know, glossy TV commercials, but at least somebody ought to stand up and say it. Oh, there's so much confusion about what the law provides. Uh, many uh, surveys have shown just how misinformed people are. And some of this, I think, is inevitable because the major provisions were put off for four years. Now, it's not inherent in healthcare legislation that four years are necessary to carry out a bill. Medicare was carried out in one year. I believe we could have had provisions to carry out this legislation more quickly, in which case people would be seeing more of the benefits. So, for example, one provision of the law that is very popular is uh, for, the, uh, for young adults up to age 26 to be able to stay on their parents' policies. That got carried out quickly. People understand it. Uh, it's very popular. That if other provisions had also been carried out, if some of the be benefits had been had been had materialized, I think people would have a better grasp of it. Um, if they could see um, what the coverage is, how much it costs, then they could judge. Right now, it's hypothetical. So it's very hard, uh, I think, for Democrats to make the case when people just. Don't see it. They don't. They don't know what it is. Do you know why though? Why did they backload it? It's a lot of it doesn't come until 2014. Was there any reason why they wrote the law that particular way? So this was a, this is an issue that um, uh, I got very concerned about uh, while the law was under consideration. So back in the early 1990s, in 1993, when I worked in the White House on the Clinton Health Plan, this was one of the areas that I worked on. It was the problem of what we called the phase-in. How do you get from here to there? And um, a key issue here has to do with um, how much responsibility resides in the federal government and how much in the states. If you leave a lot of decisions to the states, then you need 50 state legislatures to pass corresponding legislation after Congress acts. 
And you need states to act that are in the hands of the opposing party that doesn't really want to carry out this program. So um, uh, this was a very important choice that Congress made when uh, it was made in the Senate. The House, I think, had a better understanding of this, but the, the Senate bill, which became the law, uh, called for leaving the creation of the insurance exchanges to the states. And predictably, there has been very little progress, despite all the time allowed. Many states have done absolutely nothing. And uh, you know, that's, it's clearly political. Uh, uh, so we could have designed it differently. We could have had a stronger federal role. We could have also had another provision, which we had in the Clinton Health Plan, something called a rolling start, which provides money to states up front to get going faster. And states, because of their own fiscal problems, would have had tremendous incentives to qualify before 2014. In fact, some states, like Massachusetts and very possibly California, would have acted quickly to get the money and would have programs in operation. And that would affect people not only in those states, but people in other states who would hear about it from their relatives and friends who could actually see it going. So I think, you know, had different decisions been made about the phase-in, the startup, we would be in a very different place politically today. Well, I just don't understand why there hasn't been a salesman for this while the other side has been able to demagogue it and, and, and make such a big uh, fuss over this 7% Issue yeah. well, part, uh, partly money also. By the way, uh, uh, there's an article in the New York Times today that uh, estimates that uh, the op the opposition has spent more than 200 million dollars on ads against uh, the health care legislation, and there's been a fraction of that spent in support of it. So it's it's you know what we're looking at is very much the same imbalance in um, political influence that comes from money in political campaigns. It's, uh, it's, right. it's healthcare is just one aspect of that. But is it ideological or is it coming from the, the say the insurance companies? Because I, my understanding is that the insurance companies were, were invited in as they were with the Clinton health plan. Uh, the big insurance companies fought against this legislation. So. Uh, here's the story. At the very beginning of, the, of 2009, the leadership of the health insurance industry indicated an openness to um, reform. And that's what probably gave you and others the impression that they were on board. In fact, they were never on board. And in the final stages, um, uh, when the law was coming to um, uh, a vote, and first in the House and then in the Senate. Um, the f big five commercial insurers put down more than $80 million, which they channeled through the chambers of commerce to fight the legislation. So, no, they were not on board. There were some um, nonprofit health insurers uh, that did support the legislation. And so, the, ins so the, the health insurance lobby itself was somewhat split. And they, they, they didn't act with the um, uh, uni unified uh, force that they did in 1993-94 against the Clinton plan. The, the Harry okay. and Louise Yeah, that, campaign, that yeah. We, we, we didn't see that degree of mobilization. But still, the amount of money, that $80 million spent by the big five, that, that was not insignificant. Right. And they've continued to fight it and to fund a lot of this advertising against the law. But Back during the Clinton plan, did Clinton invite the insurance companies in to the negotiations? Or because uh, remember they, they said that was uh, was all being done too secretively, and uh, Hillary had a handful of people in a room, and and everybody was shut out. Uh, okay, so the um, for, first of all, ask yourself how do presidents and administrations generally prepare legislation? It's true. They mostly prepare it behind closed doors. That is normally what happens. People meet in agencies and in the White House, and they don't open it up to the press. There are a variety of complicated issues to be resolved, but of course that's legislation to be presented to Congress, where it will be openly discussed. So uh, now we did have 
meetings with representatives of a tremendous range of different groups. Came in, I sat, I was one of the people who would sit and listen to them, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, that's what, yeah, okay, all right. But we, there were no negotiations with them. And in the end, that was a bill that was presented by the administration to Congress, alas, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, do very well, but, but uh, uh, you know, there was no, you know, it, it was, it, really, it's no different from any um, presentation of legislation uh, to Congress. So in my opening remarks, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an immoderate moderator. I, I have opinions. So, <laughs> so I, I was suggesting that over the years it's gotten more and more difficult. And Teddy Kennedy said, said that one of his greatest regrets was that he didn't take up Nixon on his deal. He kept thinking that something better would happen. What is that mechanism? Why is, what are the forces that are making it more and more difficult to have universal health care in this country? Well, it's true that in the early 1970s, um, we came very close to a bipartisan agreement on uh, uh, national health insurance, uh, amazingly close. And um, although Ted Kennedy had that regret that he hadn't made a deal with Nixon, he was actually open to bargaining at that time. Um, and there, what, I believe that if Nixon had only been wounded instead of destroyed by Watergate, we would have had national health insurance that year. He was, he was um, uh, his, the, the plan that he presented in 1974 uh, was actually to the left of any plan that any Democrat has presented in recent years. Uh, so uh, he, was, he was desperate to win popularity back. So he would have signed legislation. And uh, uh, really, the whole history could have been very different had, uh, uh, had, had things, you know, had, had Nixon not um, uh, been destroyed. And Wilbur Mills, who was another key actor in that whole uh, episode, had he not ended up in the tidal basin with, with the Argentine flamingo or whatever, flamingo. Uh, what, what was her uh, name? She had a wonderful name. Fanny, Fanny Fox, Fox, right, yeah. right. So, uh, you know, uh, 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 history sometimes does depend on the particular individuals and events like Watergate. Right. Uh, but what has happened uh, since then is, first of all, the costs of health care have escalated dramatically, and because the costs have escalated so much, uh, the number of uninsured has increased because um, uh, fewer and fewer people are getting health insurance from employment. That number is going down, and uh, the and individual insurance, has, individually purchased insurance, has become so exorbitant. So uh, uh, that problem has grown worse, and instead of being able to find some point of agreement between the parties, we've moved farther apart. Um, Republicans have moved way to the right since Nixon. Um, and uh, uh, our political uh, atmosphere has just become utterly poisonous. So, so this issue, I think, has been caught up in larger historical forces. Um, and there were moments in the past when, when it might have been resolved differently. We lost those chances, and now we are stuck. We are really, really stuck. So I suppose there's no point in saying what if, uh, but you, it's hard not to say uh -huh. it, because you've already mentioned some of the things that went wrong with all the front loading and, I mean, the back loading and, and, and never being able to sell this thing and not giving people the benefit of, 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 of how, how this will improve their lives and therefore th we'd have a lot more people supporting it. And most, the polls say, about 50-something percent of the American people are against this individual mandate, not surprisingly. Um, can, one can, of the can, can I just yeah. comment one thing about, about the public opinion poll? So it's true the mandate is unpopular. It was unpopular in the earliest polls that were taken. That's one of the things that concern me about it. When you look at the overall public opinion about this legislation, you have to look beyond the question, do you support it or oppose it? Uh, and what you find often is that uh, those numbers are close to even or somewhat more oppose it than support it. But if you then ask those people who oppose it whether they oppose it because it's too liberal or not liberal enough, you find that about a quarter of the opposition is from people who say it's not liberal enough. 
uh, they would prefer a single payer plan. If you add them to the supporters of reform, it turns around and actually there's, there's, there's a majority who want health care reform, uh, but um, there's also a majority who don't like this bill. Well, the, the what if question, the first what if question is, what about, why didn't they, they take the approach of Medicare for all, which would have evolved, totally uh, insulated them against any of these legal challenges? It's already an existing program, and then you phase it in, 65, a few years later, 60, 55, 50, and so on down. Well, we may come back to that um, if this is struck down. That is, that is certainly one possible uh, response. Uh, so the big difficulty with Medicare for All has always been that um, you need to raise additional taxes. Uh, to pay for those additional Medicare beneficiaries. And what you're doing is essentially converting a private stream of revenue that now goes mainly from employers to health insurers uh, into a stream that goes through taxes. And the difficulty that you have is basically the taxophobia of the American public, the resistance to higher taxes. And um, in addition, there's something else. So, there are a lot of employees who are reasonably satisfied with their health insurance. It's not as good as it used to be for a lot of people, but uh, a lot of people are satisfied. And you risk alarming them and turning them into opponents by saying, now instead of that employer insurance, you're going to get Medicare. Um, and that, is, that has always been uh, the difficulty in, 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 in going for Medicare for all. But as I say, you know, if, if the mandate is struck down, if this whole uh, path for reform uh, is eliminated, then I think we may well be back to taking that other route. And the public option that you mentioned, uh, was it ever on the table? Uh, so... Oh, there's so much confusion about this question of the public option. And I really, you know, it was such a heated issue during the debate on the legislation. But it was never what a lot of people imagined it to be. So the public option was only going to be an option for people using the insurance exchanges. Not for everybody. And the public option... Um, many people thought the public option would be especially good because it would be very valuable for people with chronic diseases and other conditions. Well, unfortunately, if those are the people who end up in the public option, it could end up becoming a high-cost alternative. Um, there is a whole mechanism for trying to spread those costs, but, but there was a risk, and the Congressional Budget Office predicted that the public option would end up enrolling only about two or three percent of the total population, and that it would end up having higher costs than other plans. And that analysis um, really put a damper on the public option. Um, now, it's partly because of the way the public option got structured. And the, um, uh, so if the public option had been structured with Medicare payment levels, then indeed it would have been cheaper than private insurance because at this point Medicare is paying hospitals and doctors less than private insurers. Uh, and in that case it could have had a competitive advantage with uh, in, uh, uh, attracting people from private insurance. But for that very reason, the hospitals and doctors were very much opposed to it because if you transferred let's say, as one estimate had it, 100 million people from private insurance to Medicare rates, that would mean a one-time reduction in revenue for hospitals and doctors of a very substantial amount. And what happened was that many Democratic, very liberal senators and representatives heard from their hospitals and from other medical care groups who said, you just can't do this to us. Uh, we've got bond payments. We've got, you're right. going to 
destroy us if you reduce our revenues by that level. Right. So well, it, it, it gets, it, but it gets to the heart of the whole issue of, of the way we've taken this insurance approach as to the way the other countries in the developed world yes. have, that the insurance companies are an unnecessary layer. Of course they're going to fight because they have to justify their existence. And the truth of the matter is oh. you don't need them. No, no, but this has nothing... I know, that's, just an, a, that's a philosophical no, no, statement. This, no, this has to do with the peculiar way in which payment levels have evolved over the last half century so that Medicare is now paying less than private insurers. And because of that, it's not just the insurers that were opposed to the public option. Yeah. It was all these other groups in healthcare sure. who were terrified of what it would mean for them. Thanks. Um, my name is Stephen. And first, I want to say thank you, Mr. Starr, for all you've done on the issue and for just an exceedingly clear description of the history. And Ian, uh, I think you're a national treasure, and uh, oh along with being your uh, number one <laughs> fan, <laughs> along with being your number one fan, I'm actually the uh, proud owner of a pre-existing condition. And I'm actually from Massachusetts, uh, where I was originally diagnosed with that condition. It's a rare form of arthritis. Um, and the doctor who diagnosed me also gave me a stern warning, which is that you never go uninsured, never miss a payment, because you're unlikely ever to be insured again. And so in the intervening 20 years, I have never missed a payment, despite them outpacing inflation by, you know. Uh -huh. Anyway. Um, Question. Hmm? Question. Question. Um, can any, can any of either of you or anyone in the audience suggest the name or names of a person or persons who can act as an, uh, sort of a health care slash financial advisor to me. I will overpay that person and I will give you a, <laughs> I'll give you a referral fee because I am uh, uh, racing headlong or body long into bankruptcy um, because I just, I can't go uninsured. Uh, there's so many moving parts to this whole thing and we don't know what's gonna happen or not that I feel like the safest thing to do is just keep paying. But there's just got to be something better than $650 a month, whether or not I'm unemployed, which I actually am right now. So just, I'll be around, and if anyone has a name and a number of anyone, uh, I'm all ears because it's just, it's, it's just unjust. It's exactly the kind of problem that our system has produced. And you, know, you are one of many people who are facing those difficult choices. If the mandate gets rejected by the Supreme Court, what is the Republicans' alternative to ensure the majority of the uninsured beyond what the Democrats have proposed? And um, wow. that's my question. Yeah, well, um, uh, Mitt Romney and other Republicans um, really haven't proposed a full-scale alternative. They've said repeal and replace, but it's really very, rather vague as to what the replace uh, involves. Now, one idea that, uh, uh, that Romney has talked about, really, and McCain talked about, and many Republicans have talked about over uh, time, is uh, the idea of, um, of changing the tax treatment of health insurance. And um, this can be presented to sound very attractive to people, but I, it's partly because they just don't understand the implications of the current tax treatment. And so the idea would, right, right now, employer contributions to health insurance are not counted as taxable income. And that's huge. That is actually the second biggest federal health program after Medicare. But it's almost invisible. People don't really understand that they're getting that tax benefit. They don't even know how much their employer is paying, and they don't know how much it's worth to them uh, that that isn't counted as taxable income. Uh, so Republicans have proposed eliminating that and substituting instead a tax credit. The tax credit would be 2,500, this is McCain's proposal, was $2,500 per individual and $5,000 per family. Now since a lot of people don't know how much the existing tax benefit is worth, they don't know how to weigh 
this proposal. It would have the advantage that some people who now don't get employer-provided insurance would get this tax credit. That's a positive thing. On the other hand, it would mean that there wouldn't be the incentives for many employers to offer health insurance. And the estimates have varied as to how much employer-provided insurance would, would, would decline once you change the tax treatment. It would decline significantly, but you know, 10 million, 20 million people would lose their employer-provided coverage. Instead of getting it from their employer, they'd have to go out into the individual insurance market and buy it. That's the most inefficient part of the whole healthcare financing system because so much of every premium dollar goes into the overhead, the marketing costs and so forth. 30, 40 cents on the dollar gets sucked up by administrative costs in the current system. That's supposed to change under, under the ex exchanges and so forth. So, so the idea of moving people from employer provided to individual insurance to me is just not a very good idea, but it is something that many Republicans believe is really the way we ought to go. Hi, um, I'm wondering right now, part of the argument for universal health care is that it will stop the huge numbers of people who are rushed to emergency rooms. Well, actually, we do have um, a federal law that uh, requires hospitals to take care of people in emergencies, to at least stabilize them in emergencies, uh, regardless of their ability to pay. That is the one right to health care that exists for all Americans under federal law. Now, it's not a very broad right. It's only to the point of stabilization. It's not full treatment in the emergency rooms. But that's what's been left for many people. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting uh, that, that you bring this up, because it came up in the oral argument at the Supreme Court. And uh, it came up um, uh, when the Solicitor General um, was arguing that um, uh, we have, he said, we have uh, bound ourselves to certain ethical norms um, uh, to treat people regardless of their ability to pay. And Justice Scalia said at that point, well, don't obligate yourself to that. Don't, obli don't obligate yourself to treat people in those situations. And the, the Solicitor General, I, th I think, was really quite a moment because um, the Solicitor General is the one who represents the administration in, in, those, in those arguments. This is Donald Varelli. I think he was really taken aback by that statement. It was really quite an extraordinary statement that we shouldn't, you know, we should just let the injured bleed to death, I guess. We should, we should let the contagiously ill go back out and infect other people. We, you know, this is, this is really quite uh, extraordinary. Hi, I'm a, I'm a professor of law. I've actually taught here at UCLA. I'm teaching now at USC. Uh, I think we're really uh, underestimating this decision. This decision, as much as it's going to affect uh, medical care, and presumably because health is such an important thing, it will in some way or other get rectified. Scalia be damned. <laughs> but what this is really is, is we don't understand the agenda here. The agenda has nothing to do with health care in this decision. The agenda is to curtail Congress's power to act under the Interstate Commerce Clause, which means it's the opening ambit to destroy all environmental laws, which thereafter now, clean air, clean water, regulation of, of uh, fracking, uh, everything you can imagine. Thereafter, the racial discrimination laws, those are next to go. Uh, the whole question about who can go in to, uh, you know, to eat in a restaurant or everything else we've enacted under Congress's power. And this is the deadly, this is the way Roberts acts. So my question to you is, have you thought about this whole interstate commerce question? What, what do you think is the basis, okay, of what interstate commerce will be after this decision comes down? Well, I do think the, this 
case could have broader implications. I think you're absolutely right about that. Certainly, uh, the law professor, Randy Barnett, who, drew, who, who, who uh, conceived the argument that, that was presented to the court, has much broader ambitions going after the whole New Deal. Um, so uh, yeah, I do think, I do think there, is, there is a tremendous amount at stake. Uh, uh, I, I think it is very unfortunate that the law was not written with a clearer use of the taxing power. So uh, I mentioned that um, a key issue is whether the penalties under the law are considered a tax from the point of view of that 1867 statute. There's also the general question as to whether or not the mandate is constitutional under the taxing power of Congress. Now, the administration did make that argument, but the law itself actually doesn't have the word tax in it. It says penalties rather than tax penalties. And that, I understand, came at the direct instruction of the White House for political reasons. They didn't want the word tax in there. And so they sacrificed a part of the constitutional argument uh, to uphold the law. And it will be a great uh, uh, irony if um, the law goes down partly because of the failure to use the word tax. Um, you know, on the gravestone, of the Affordable Care Act, it may read, died of taxophobia. But the gentleman's question is key, isn't it? Because I understand that the only way that FDR was able to get his new deal through was through the Interstate Commerce Clause. And he actually had to put somebody else on the court, I think, to, to threaten to put nine, to stack the court uh -huh. and swayed one to do it. So I think the question there was, will this, is this the beginning of, of you know, destroying the the, oh. the, the, fa the, the, the foundation of, of so oh. much of our hmm. well, regressive uh, law in this country. Okay, so, so the court did curtail <clears throat> the use of the Interstate Commerce Clause in two decisions uh, in 1995 and 2000, uh, but in some other decisions, uh, even Scalia has interpreted the Interstate Commerce Clause very broadly. So there really were contradictory implications, uh, indications going into this case. Uh, it's not clear to me that even the conservative justices would like to give up the use of the Interstate Commerce Clause for a lot of purposes that they approve. No, I'm definitely not uh, <laughs> a lady. Uh, Never had that problem. Um, <laughs> But I, I do have a, a, a concern. Uh, I think you, from my point of view, made uh, an accurate argument for the free markets. In studying pigeons for uh, six months, it seems like uh, pigeons, when uh, they get a liberal handout, they start to assume more risk and come on tables. And But then you start to see the feathers, uh, uh, they just start to, to die. Uh, and then when you look at pigeons who are freely seeking worm, uh, they're healthy and they glow. Uh, my, my concern is that uh, the law, if passed, will take away uh, choice. So I'd like to know from uh, your point of view, what percentage of the American people uses the resources, because my understanding is that only 5% of the American people are using up 50% of the health resources, which means that we're paying for 5%. Um, so can you give me some, uh, some thought on that? Okay, so it's true that in any given year, in any given year, a relatively small percentage of people end up accounting for a very large percentage of healthcare costs. Of course, we don't know at the beginning of the year who those people are gonna be. Uh, that's the thing about health. You may feel like you're in great health one moment, and the next, you may be in an accident, you may suddenly experience pains, you may have a serious problem. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that makes the economics of healthcare so different from the economics of other uh, fields. 
uh, there's a tremendous concentration of costs in a very few individuals. And that's why we need health insurance. That's it's the risk that uh, uh, that that uh, you know, exists. Um, and you know, so but I think your question is really your question is about freedom, about about you know whether whether people will be uh, more or less free as the result of having some kind of protection against risk. And your worry is that people get too protected against risk. Well, um, let's consider the case of Social Security. Social Security, the tax is mandatory. We all have to pay it when we work. Loss of freedom, right? On the other hand, what used to happen when uh, people uh, could no longer work, they got old, they became dependent often on their children or actually uh, uh, ended up in poor houses. Uh, uh, that was a real loss of freedom. Turns out, I think, what most people would say today is that Social Security helps preserve the independence of seniors. It enables them to live a freer life than the elderly were able to live before Social Security was created. So yeah, there is a mandatory aspect to it. You have to pay the tax. But I think most people have come to the conclusion that it actually, overall, enhances their freedom. And I think you have to ask the same question about health care. So to be sick is to be dependent often. It's to experience a real loss of freedom in your, your life. And insofar as we create a situation where many people can't pay for their health care, they will really suffer and lose freedom of action. So by protecting them, yeah, well, there is a mandatory aspect. You'd have to pay for insurance. But there's a benefit, too. And I think just as with Social Security, the balance is to create a greater freedom for more people by protecting them from risks which they cannot manage entirely by themselves. By the way, everybody in the rest of the civilized world, if you will, has, has pretty much free health care. It removes enormous anxiety. It's the largest cause of bankruptcy in small business. So if you're a right winger, then you got to be in, in favor of it. And in many ways, you know, uh, that was what was happening. Uh, is, for example, General Motors was starting to move its plants, its work, its uh, plants into Canada because of health care. Their health care costs were getting cut. There, there ought to be a, you know, on the part of corporate America, an incentive to understand that, don't you think? Yeah, or let me give you another example that goes to the heart of your question, I think. It's, it's the problem of job lock. So m many people have a good job uh, from which they get health insurance. And let's say they have an idea for a new business. Let's say they have an idea for a new startup. But if they, go out, if they go out on their own and they lose the health insurance coverage that they had before, uh, they may not be able to take care, let's say, of a child who has some chronic condition. So they end up staying in the job, which really doesn't make full use of their talents and capabilities. We're losing a lot in our economy because of job lock, because there are a lot of people who are just stuck, who aren't able to do what they would want to do if they were really free and they didn't have to worry about health insurance, uh, they could do a lot more. Where to begin? Um, well, with Congress and uh, a lot of people in government not having to deal with this issue at all, doesn't, you know, it's not number one on their list of priorities. Um, and when you talk about job lock, what jobs? Um, corporations are finding new ways of um, manipulating the system so that people are not even fully employed even when they are fully employed. They're insisting that they put down a, a minimum number of hours even if they work 40 hours a week. So they don't get their benefits. So what is, it's all kind of skewed. So who, who benefits from fucking us? And how many people here are insured? Can we have a show of hands, please? Is anybody insured here? Can you guys tell from up front, you know, kind of what and what that looks like in terms of percentage? Yeah, it's at least 50%. Okay. Are these jobs? Okay, do you insured? have a question? But anyway, so, so who benefits from, from screwing us? 
the, who, who are the they there? there? Uh, well, uh, so a lot of people here are saying insurance companies. And let me just, uh, I, I have, uh, I guess I have a more complicated answer as to what happened historically that got us into this situation. And in this book of mine, Remedy and Reaction, I talk about what I call the American health policy trap. And that trap, I believe, came from enacting a series of partial measures during the mid-20th century that benefited particular groups. And what happened is we took care of veterans. We had that tax benefit for uh, employees. We passed Medicare. All these uh, programs, first of all, channeled an increasing flow of resources into healthcare and tremendously enriched the healthcare industry. Yes, that happened. They also satisfied the best organized groups in the society and they took them out of being concerned about getting coverage for those who had been left out. And those programs also concealed a lot of the cost. People didn't realize just how bad it was getting. And then finally, what I argue in the book is that these programs created a kind of moral message. So veterans and seniors and employees believed they earned their health care. And many people became quite emphatic about this. Yeah, I earned it. I pay for it. If you want it, you go pay for it. Don't tax me. And it created a whole way of thinking that has made it very difficult to establish some kind of common sense of a shared uh, responsibility uh, for the cost of health care. It didn't have to end up this way, but we, we followed certain policies that have encouraged people to think in a way that, that makes it hard for us to solve the problem. Thanks. Uh, I think Ian asked you several times, uh, why didn't the Democrats explain the way you did today and took the beating from Tea Party? And the president himself chose to go into hiding at uh, that time. But my two questions are um, really, because they didn't, we are so ignorant, I am. First of all, the economics of healthcare. Why is the cost so staggeringly inflating? I'm sorry, why is the what? Why is the cost of healthcare inflating so much at such a higher rate than the regular, regular uh, inflation? So that is question one. And question two is, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that the majority of the middle class and of course the rich, would be beyond the subsidy that the healthcare law would provide. So what would their cost, whatever they would have to pay in, would that be greater, same, or less than what we are buying uh, private insurance right now? So what is the economics, both of the questions is actual cost, thank you. Okay, those are very, complicated and extensive question. So the first question about why, why has the cost of health care grown as much as it has? So um, the health care now has um, reached the point where it's just about 18% of gross domestic product of the U.S. economy. That's almost twice the level of other rich democracies in Europe, Japan, so forth. Um, it's a staggering difference in uh, the cost of health care. And when you look comparatively, uh, what is striking is not that Americans get more health care. We don't get, uh, Americans actually don't go to the doctor especially um, much uh, uh, compared to the Germans, let's say, uh, the French. They don't have the freedom to. Well, so it's not, it's not the volume of services. Uh, there are some high-tech services that are greater here, but that doesn't account for most of the difference. So the difference, it turns out, is not the volume of services. It's the price of services. Prices in the United States for everything are much higher than in other countries. Prices for drugs, prices for medical devices, prices for doctor services, for hospitals, and for insurance, yes. All those things, that's partly because of the tremendous bureaucratic overhead 
that is built into the American healthcare system. It's one of the great ironies. Americans think government is responsible for most bureaucracy, but in healthcare, it's the private market system that has generated much greater bureaucratic overhead costs than uh, the government programs in other countries. So that is, that is, that is part of the story. Uh, it's also because the price system just doesn't work at all in healthcare. So uh, uh, in most uh, fields, you can get uh, prices from businesses. They'll tell you what the prices are. Well, in fact, in healthcare, um, uh, you generally can't find out what the different prices are. Uh, uh, let's say hospitals uh, charge. In fact, hospitals don't have a single price for a service. They charge different prices to different insurers. They may have 12 different prices for the same service. And they can't actually quote you a, a price un and, uh, until they know whether you're insured or not, uh, who your insurer is. Uh, there's no, um, uh, the, 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 the market system here is just not working in the way that it's supposed to work in other fields. All of this is, is I think, responsible for the tremendous growth of healthcare across the United States. Uh, there's a lot more to that story. Uh, and now, uh, the other part of your question was about... Uh, so actually, um, uh, the, the subsidies extend uh, up to um, four times the poverty level on a sliding scale. That does reach into the lower to the middle class. Uh, uh, it's it it is it's a very uh, um, uh, it's a very broad subsidy system um, for the people who use the insurance exchanges. Now, if you're already getting insurance from your employer, you wouldn't you wouldn't be subsidized. That's true. But if you b are buying insurance through the exchanges, uh, your your costs would be limited. The premiums would be limited to um, no more than eight or nine percent of your income. So that's the, the, the subsidies are geared to keep the cost within those percentages of income. Oh, yeah. And thank you so much. Thank you.